we want to know the history. Which when, when is this history? History of the museum. Yeah. Uh, the museum began in the year 1932 uh, and it was established here in Carlisle Castle, which was where the soldiers of the old border regiment used to train. And they had collections of material which they decided to put into uh, a proper museum so that the young soldiers as they joined the regiment could look at aspects of the regiment's history. So the large building off to my left, the great big keep of the castle, is where the museum was until 1970. And the building that you visited uh, in the inner ward of the castle uh, is where it's been since 1973. And then just over to our left is where the museum is going to move to. Alma Block uh, opening later on this year, so we've, we've been on the go in the castle for 82 years. Okay. Um, how do you manage the, the, the museum? Which is the management? Which is the management? Okay, the, the museum is a, is a charitable trust. So it, it's a museum like any any other, but it is a it is a registered charity of which there are there are many in the United Kingdom, and there are many museums and galleries that are run for those things. So we have we have a board of trustees, and then from the the day to day management side, there's our staff team. There's three of us here today, uh, and there are three other members of the staff. So there are six of us uh, who do the day to day work of running the museum. Can you tell us about the collection? What's made of? Which are the things that are in the collection? Well, we've, we've got all sorts of things in the collection. We've, from medals to uniforms to, to personal letters um, to, to weaponry. Um, pretty much anything you can think of is related to our regiment and uh, its history. We've, we've, we've got it in there. Oh. <laughs> um, can you uh, which is this, the history of the 34th Regiment? Do you know anything about it? Right. I mean, the the, the what what we refer to now um, as the, this was the home of what used to be called the Border Regiment. Then prior wait, to the, wait a moment, please, sorry, because uh, the because sorry. on the ambulance. <laughs> Yeah, prior, the, the local regiment here, the Border Regiment, prior, prior to the year 1881, uh, it was two separate regiments, um, the 34th Cumberland Regiment and the 55th Westman Regiment, and the 34th Foot, or Cumberland Regiment, takes its history back to the year 1702, when it was formed, um, and it gets the county title to Cumberland in 1782. Uh, as far as the items that we have for that history, um, there aren't that many artefacts, uh, but perhaps the most important things we have in the museum as a whole and from the period that they existed as a regiment uh, are relics of the battle at Arroyo Molinos where we have the original six French drums and the drum major staff uh, of the French 34th Regiment who our 34th met in battle uh, at Arroyo Molinos in 1811. So they are really a very, very special part of our collection. Okay, maybe this question is about education. Okay, then yeah, I can answer that. Yes, because <laughs> it, we want to know the, the influence of the regiment in Carlisle. Uh, if people in Carlisle know anything about the regiment. I think that they do. Um, we work a lot with different audiences, so we work a lot with schools, with family groups, with ex-servicemen and a lot of them are, are respectful of the history of the regiment because the Carlisle Castle and the, and the museum have been here such a long time and so well established. And we deliver a, an active programme of activity and we've been looking at planning for the future this morning. And so we will link back to significant dates in the regiment's history, which Arroyo Day is one of them. And we will look at how we can engage audiences with that history. So in that you've got the history of the regiment, you've got working with audiences, and you've got a particular activity that will bring it all together. Okay. Um, um, do people have knowledge about the Peninsula War?
Yeah. It, it, it is very limited. It's, limited. A, it's a long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, the inter there, there is a huge interest in the Peninsula War across the country, but in, in view of how long ago it is, not many people will know about it. If you mention it to people, if you say the Duke of Wellington or fighting in Portugal and Spain or the Battle of Waterloo, fine, they will, they will probably know about that. But if you ask people, have you heard of the Battle of Arroyo Molinos or Vitoria or Salamanca, they might struggle to, to know which war you're talking about. Um... Can you uh, tell us a, a brief description of a Rojo Day? Right, the, the day itself, uh, the 28th of October, um, with it becoming a, a unique battle honour for the, for the old 34th Foot and the Border Regiment, uh, a Rojo Day in, in the Victorian period began to be commemorated uh, as a special regimental day. Um, the first uh, occasion where we've got photographic evidence of the, the French drums being carried on the parade is 1905, uh, where they were based down in Plymouth. Uh, and then after the First World War, um, the formal bit of the parade, um, not just celebrating the day, but where the drums are carried. Um, in the 1920s, they started to dress seven drummers uh, as the, the drummers of the regiment would have looked in 1811. So they came on parade wearing the period uniforms and they would carry the six French drums and the drum major's staff. And our regimental band would, would play three pieces of French music. Uh, the Marseillaise, uh, a tune called La, La Reve Passe, Passe, which I think was the regimental march of the French 34th. So it became a formal process. And whenever they could do it, and it was always, it, the biggest day was with the successor to the 34th Foot, which was our first battalion. But they, they would have the parade and then in years like during the First World War, the Second World War, where they didn't have a parade, they would still try and do something to commemorate Arroyo Day. And it has continued, it continued right up to 1959 and then when the regiment changed its name to the King's Own Royal Border Regiment, they carried it on. And now we are part of the Duke of Lancaster's regiment. Arroyo Day is still a special regimental day, so it's survived right until the present day. And as a museum, we're looking at Arroyo Day becoming a day when we have something happening. For us, the 28th of October is often school holidays, so we feel this is an opportunity where we can broaden out the knowledge of, of a very particular and specific battle on them. And so we will start that this year. In your opinion, um, in what way, um, which are the ways to improve uh, people's knowledge uh, about this common history we're talking about, Spanish, British? How, how can we strengthen links between yeah. the two countries yeah. with a, a common history through schools? But obviously for us we have a very specific curriculum that we have to follow of which the Peninsula War doesn't really sit in that unless you look at much older children and they look at that whole period um, and that's only a very small percentage of, of young people that will engage with that. But I think through um, links with Spain, so we've, we've talked today about international links and how can, how can we look at working with maybe a museum in Spain and looking at our history here and history there and maybe there's something we can do together, that could be an exhibition, that could be some sort of exchange of curators or information and with technology now that should make things easier but also it's about engaging audiences so looking at maybe young people and getting them interested in that getting encouraging them to research and find out more about that particular period and put it into context so it might be that they research 1811 it might be they research later times maybe they look at the progression through history of the links between Spain and ourselves so I think there's lots of ways of doing that one of the problems we have is, you know, how do we start that process? Because there's obviously a financial outlay there, and we, and we have to look at that. But that's something we need to we need to investigate these possibilities. The, the other area, perhaps, is is probably the comparative things over the uh, the life of the soldier. So yes. that you know, we we look at the lives of the soldiers now and the equipment that they have, and we compare it with the Second World War and the First World War and so on. And you know, you could take this back 
to 150 years ago to 200 years ago when our regiment was in Spain and how did the, the soldiers actually cope with living, serving and fighting in that particular period of time when you know health, diet, conditions and so on were completely different to the way we live now. So perhaps a comparative thing about how life was then um, would, would be another way of looking at it rather than just down the purely historical you know, a, ba a battle here, a battle there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a question for, just for you, for all. Has been a, a men's world during a lot of centuries, maybe. What what uh, what has been the process? Uh, for the entrance, for the entry of women, no, not 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 more, not not in the army, but in the in the study the and. Of that, of mm. that. I think I think that's a good question. I think a lot of women are put off by boys and toys, we call it, so guns and, and the very military side of it. But there is a social side to, to the soldiers' history. In other words, there is an element of what happened to the family. You know, where did that come from? And I think women can engage with that part of it as well. You know, what was happening at home? You know, what were their family lives like before they joined the army? Were they made to join the army? Did they join the army for a particular reason? What happened if they got married? Were they allowed to get married? What happened to families? What happens if the soldier died? So all that side of it, I think women are more interested in that than they are about the fighting. What were their conditions like? How did they eat? What did they wear? You know, who made their uniforms? Um, all, all that sort of stuff, the more social side I think is where women can engage and, and so we need to look at how we portray that particular period of history or any period of history to make it more welcoming for women so they get past just the weaponry and the equipment. Hmm. One, one particular interest with, with the peninsula, we're, we're quite lucky uh, because we've got several uh, biographies and, and, and written histories. There's a couple by officers, a guy called Moyle Shear and, and George Bell. George Bell refers to the ladies of the regiment in the peninsula and there's this amazing lady who's called Biddy Skiddy uh, and in the National Army Museum there was a famous tableau of this lady carrying her husband Daniel yeah. on her back with their daughter tramping alongside them carrying his musket um, and these ladies are referred to by George Bell you know they were the nurses they did the cooking and in the history of the 34th there's a, a remarkable journey, journal of a lady called Catherine Exley um, whose husband served in the 34th foot and I think it's the only surviving journal written by a soldier's wife. Uh, she bears several children in Spain and Portugal, only one survives um, and when they finally get back to England she's without her husband for nine months because he's taken prisoner, uh, their one child who survives the baptism records in, in the Yorkshire church where he was baptised show him baptised, I think, age six, born in Portugal. Uh, and he's the one survivor. So not only has this wife gone along with her husband uh, and tried to survive, she has borne several children who've died uh, serving in Portugal and Spain in what conditions which are unbelievable. So there is, there is, a, there is a parallel history of what the families were doing that time. Um, which isn't perhaps as well known as it should be. Something else? And maybe a question for... Uh, it's Mark or Max? Matt. Matt. Uh, how come... Um, when we try to, to, to engage audience, audiences, for example, for, for documentary, for uh, museums, we need to fight mostly in with with young people with uh, with the audiovisual culture so we do documentary our filming maybe more more real than a film but a film is more spectacular when you are showing the the, the guns i'm more i'm more real than the than the than the, a video game for example but mm, how the 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 Hollywood films or the video games are more maybe are more engaging to yes. the yeah. um, 
question is how how, how can we improve improve the 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 work in a museum, the work in, in documentary in documentation to 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 fight and win against the action films, against video games, etc. Um, I suppose it's because you could look at it as a sense that well, this is real life. This is actually what happens. It's all very well uh, escaping into um, action, you know, films and Hollywood blockbusters, but um, there's always a story of real life behind all of those as well. And this is the, you know, this is the, the real life that what actually happened. Um, and to be honest, there's, there's there's good stories to be there. There's um, there's the all, all these stories originate from history, and uh, history is full of absolutely f fascinating stories um, that, that, have, that have gone on. Perhaps the other way you can do it is kind of an age comparison thing. Um, a lot of the soldiers who went to the peninsula, uh, to, to Portugal and Spain, you know, some were, were, were older, but there were an awful lot of young people. Um, you know, there were a people of what we would call school age, serving in the British Army or the Portuguese, or the French Army for that matter. Um, so how would, how would young people of 16, 17 today see themselves tramping across their country or travelling in a bullock cart or something like that, um, carrying all this stuff um, and perhaps being expected to fight as well uh, alongside people who are in their 20s or 30s or perhaps even older um, and you know, in conditions that we just couldn't imagine today. So maybe, maybe that comparative thing could work. So for our partner, nothing else, you want to add something? <laughs> you want to add something? I just think it's, you know, opportunities to work with, for us, or to work or engage with people that are interested in a common history here. Um, I think it's fantastic and I think we, we, should ex we should, as a museum, exploit that more and look for those links and look at ways that, you know, we can find out more about our regiment's past from a different perspective, um, from somebody that, you know, people that live in that particular area or who have a different viewpoint uh, of the same period of history and I think that's really exciting and that, and that lends itself to a lot of engagement but also a lot of discussion and, um, and that's good for us and I think that's good for anybody studying any period of history.